So I'm going to talk about um, IVUS OCT and FFR, and these are obviously adjuvants to coronary angiography, as Dr. Raisner talked about. And there are um, recognized limitation to angiography, so th these are uh, tools that you have. But also, there's been a lot of clinical trials that I'm not going to touch on too much. This is going to be more nuts and bolts since this is boot camp. But some of the landmark um, prevention trials looking at statins 10 years ago used some IVIS endpoints, so it's important to understand, and hopefully by the end of this, that's what you'll do. OCT uh, really doesn't have any um, firm clinical utility, although it has really pretty pictures, which I'll show you. And FFR has, I think, grown a little bit in utility as far as decision making based on some data we'll look at. So here are your uh, tools that you have in the cath lab to further image the coronary arteries. So you heard about uh, angiography. I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about IVIS. Near infrared spect is um, just now uh, starting to get a little bit of momentum as far as potential clinical utility. Angioscopy is something you'll probably never see except in an uh, old journal somewhere. And OCT you'll see more and more of, and you can see, and I'm not going to go through every um, cell here in this, in this chart, but it's, it's very high resolution as far as the images, and sometimes the problem is it's so good you don't know what to do with these things you, you never thought you'd see, and I'll show you some of that. Um, so in the most simplistic form, IVIS is an image that's an ultrasound wave that bounces off the tissue or vessel wall and the layers of the artery and then returns to the transducer. So depending on the acoustic, the acoustic impedance, meaning how dense the tissue is, um, the vessel, you'll, you'll either get a lighter or a darker uh, reflection. And in order to interpret these images, you need to have an understanding of some very, very basic um, vascular anatomy and that outside of the lumen of the artery, the first layer is the intima. Beyond that is the media, and most of your plaque will be in between that zone, and beyond the media is the adventitia. Now, what I do when I do IVIS is I find the media first, and you'll see it's a black ring. So once you find the media, you can determine what's the intima, what's the adventitia, and then what's the plaque burden, if there is any, if you're looking for um, disease. So here are two examples of um, IVIS images. The one on the, the left shows the, the black dot in the middle is the IVIS catheter. So you always have a, a little bit of an artifact there with that dropout sort of at 5 o'clock from the wire that the IVIS catheter is on. Between each one of those white dots is generally a millimeter, depending on how it's calibrated. But in the coronaries, these are calibrated to a millimeter. So you can count those, and you can see roughly this is a 3 and a quarter, 3.5 millimeter vessel as far as diameter. But in IVIS, we mostly talk about uh, cross-sectional area, which we'll, we'll look at in a second. But taking that image on the left, see the, if you can see that black rim outside of the white rim, that's your media. So if you find that, that gives you a landmark where to start as far as determining whether or not there's any plaque. And if there is plaque, you'd want to measure the circumference of the media to determine what would the reference vessel uh, cor uh, correct size be. Um, so if you were going to go on and treat this with a stent or something, you would size it to the media. So there's basically, when you really cut it down to what you're looking at IVIS, you want a, a couple of measurements. One is um, you want to identify the lumen, and then beyond that, as I mentioned, you need to identify that border of the external elastic lamina, which is your, your media, that black line. And then you take the two and you, you form a ratio to determine what your uh, plaque burden is. So this is, as opposed to the last image, you're looking at a disease vessel here. So again, looking at the left side, you have your transducer, the black dot in the middle, and then the um, lumen, which is sort of the dark space, which is blood. And then beyond that, if you go and find the uh, media, you can see it's that black line that on the right-hand side has been traced in that light blue. So that's the normal, that's your reference vessel. And everything in between the lumen, which is outlined in the yellow line, and the media, which is uh, outlined in the blue line, that's your plaque burden. So you take the ratio of those two areas to determine whether or not this is significant. And in intravascular ultrasound, generally 60% stenosis by area is deemed significant. Here is sometimes you can't get that reference uh, vessel um, media uh, 
uh, tracing because there's calcification and dropout or whatever, and you, you can't see um, what the normal artery size would be. So in that setting, you take as normal of a um, section of artery as you can find just proximal to your lesion and use that as your sort of denominator when you're calculating uh, the percent lumen area stenosis. Um, absolute values, rather than uh, comparing values to some sort of reference segment, are commonly used as well. And the two sort of numbers to remember for absolute values of um, mean cross-sectional area or mean luminal area would be for the proximal epicardial vessels, meaning the LAD, right coronary, and left circumflex, and an area of less than four millimeters squared is generally considered uh, significant, and that's based on FFR data and other sort of ischemic tests. And the left main would be considered significant if it had a minimal luminal area of less than six millimeters squared. Now, the data on those, which I'm not gonna show you, aren't the most robust in the world, but they're um, fairly well accepted, and generally people uh, still refer to these measurements as what determines something to be significant or not. So some of the um, other, other details you can get out of intravascular ultrasound are what is the plaque made of. Um, calcium, which we see frequently, causes very bright echoes, as you can imagine, and creates shadowing or dropout. So when there's a heavily calcified plaque, beyond that plaque is where you'll have dropout. You won't really have any image um, for the ultrasound to bounce back on, and that's where you also lose uh, the, the media um, localization. Hard and dense plaque can generally still be seen through, so you can see the, the media layer. And then soft plaque is, is very... Um, is, is very dark, as you'll see here. So here are four different examples of IVIS images. The upper left shows one with very mild plaque. So if you go and find that uh, black line of the media, you see um, just luminal to that or from about 3 o'clock around to 9 o'clock in an arc is some mild plaque. On the upper right-hand corner, um, as opposed to the, the previous image, you actually have a significant plaque burden. So again, you take your, your tracing around the media and compare that to your luminal area, and you can see that entire area from 12 o'clock around to 7 o'clock is a big, uh, thick piece of what would be relatively um, soft plaque. And then compare that to the lower left, which is a heavily calcified plaque. So essentially, you, you don't see the media, you see a ring of intimal calcification and really essentially a lot of dropout, meaning beyond that white um, uh, arc, you don't see anything. And so there you really don't have a sense of what the reference vessel diameter would be and that's when you would have to use something either more proximal um, is, is if you can find a normal area. And then the lower right is um, what's uh, an area that's been previously treated with a stent so you see those white dashed lines kind of around the intima. Those are stent struts. And inside of that, you can sort of appreciate a little bit of uh, neointimal growth or, or some mild instant restenosis. So that's, that's sort of the, um, you know, most of what you, you want to get out at this stage out of intravascular ultrasound. There are lots of other things we use it for in advanced um, PCI and addressing CTOs and determining whether or not we're in the lumen. Um, it can be uh, very helpful, but for, you know, basic coronary um, atherosclerosis evaluations, these, these are the type of images that you'll see. OCT um, is a little bit different as opposed, I mean, the first thing you out clearly notice is it's a much prettier picture, but, but beyond that, there's, there's a lot of differences. It's not an ultrasound. It's, it's, a, it's like putting a really powerful flashlight uh, inside the coronary artery and clearing the coronary out of, out of blood. And, and then filling it with um, contrast. So you get these really uh, high resolution images. The limitation here is that the tissue penetration is much less. It's only a couple millimeters, where with intravascular ultrasound you can see you know, five to 10 millimeters um, beyond, beyond the lumen. But it's your same landmarks. You see the, on the left-hand side the catheter and the wire artifact is that dropout uh, down at sort of seven o'clock but your, your same anatomy with the uh, intima, intima media and, and adventitia. But on the right-hand side is an example of something that in, Ivis really probably would not pick up, and this would be someone who came with an acute coronary syndrome, what had 
appeared to be essentially non-obstructive or you know no culprit lesion and then you do an OCT run on what you thought was going to be the culprit lesion and down there at five o'clock you see a, um, a cap rupture and really probably what was the cause of the acute coronary syndrome and some uh, clot up at uh, the upper um, right around uh, 10 o'clock and these are things that you know clearly and in, in once you do or see a lot of this this would generally not be picked up in a um, ibis so very nice images and they both have advantages and disadvantages primarily um, they're both used sort of how to treat not should should you treat ffr is more of a should you treat modality um, generally ibis is uh, has the, gr the greater penetration you don't have to um, use these large boluses of contrast to get very good images. It has less resolution. OCT has better resolution, but the downside being um, having to give a lot of contrast to get good images. As far as clinical data, there's much more clinical data um, behind IVIS than there is for OCT currently, um, but that'll, that'll evolve over the next few years. So switching gears to um, FFR, that's more of a, you know, should you treat this lesion? Um, evaluation. And it's the assessment of the effects of intermediate coronary stenosis. So you want to evaluate lesions that are 30 to 70 percent. That's where FFR has been validated in patients with symptoms. Um, you can also be useful as an alternative to, to performing a non-invasive functional testing to determine whether an invention is warranted. So for example, a lot of people do end up in the cath lab, um, particularly pre-transplants, without a non-invasive test. And rather than taking them off the table and sending them for a nuke or something and then bring them back, you can answer the question then and there if there's an intermediate lesion that you want to know if that pretends any risk and whether or not it should be uh, treated. And then lastly, there is um, some utility in FFR in evaluating patients with symptoms without apparent angiographic lesions. And we've seen this several times. And what you find is, for example, you had someone with anterior ischemia, you do the angiogram, the LED is fairly unremarkable. Um, but you put, you, you do a, an FFR, which we'll show you in a second, and you find that there is a significant drop in perfusion as you go down the LED, and you pull it back and there's really no culprit, it's just a sign of diffuse disease. So this is someone that may be well, you know, well treated with a lima, rather than stenting their entire uh, LED because you've, you've diagnosed them with a functionally significant disease but it's diffuse and really um, not apparent angiographically. So we talk about, when we talk about FFRs in the cath lab, we're actually talking about pressure. And the reason is, this is, uh, FFR comes from Ohm's law, and in order uh, to narrow it down to a ratio of pressures, you create all the other variables, um, you, you create an environment where all the other variables are equal. So you equalize the flow and the resistance. And by doing, in order to do that, you have to give something like Dr. Mamarian was talking about, something to induce maximal hyperemia. So any true FFR is only in the setting of maximal hyperemia when you've given um, an agent to do that. We use adenosine. It doesn't matter if you give it intracoronary or intravenously, um, just as long as you dose things appropriately and interpret things appropriately. So before you go in with your wire, you equalize your probe, and now there are also catheters that do FFR. They're sort of um, rapid exchange catheters. Either one is, is just as good. There are a couple of wires and a catheter. You equalize everything in the aorta. You move your pressure sensor, whether it's a catheter or wire, distal to the lesion that you're um, interrogating, and then you give uh, whatever agent to induce maximal hyperemia and uh, determine whether or not it's significant. So the basics, this is just the one slide on the sort of fundamentals of FFR. It's a flow index derived from hyperemic pressure. It takes into account collateral flow. It's applicable in multivessel disease. So it's, you know, in the, in the stress lab, when you're looking for um, abnormalities on spec or nuke, you're assuming or hoping that there's a normal area because those are all relative uh, flows. Here, it's, it can be lesion and stenosis specific. A normal value is unequivocally one. Um, significant stenosis is uh, a moving target. I mean, less than one is abnormal. Clinical data 
um, specifically the FAME trial, determined that less than or equal to 0 0.8 of a ratio was um, significant, but others would argue it may be even lower than that. And it's independent from prevailing hemodynamics. Coronary flow reserve and coronary flow assessments are, are very dependent on filling pressures, heart rate, blood pressure, et cetera. FFR is completely independent of that. So here's a quick case of a guy who came in with ACS, and it was determined that the um, left circumflex was probably the culprit. It's a dominant circumflex uh, with those two lesions, but there's also um, some, some disease in the LAD. The LED is diffusely diseased with also some, some distal lesion, and then there's a small uh, OM. So the way this guy got treated was he had his circumflex treated as the uh, culprit, and then we did an FFR of the LED. So here's the baseline where you equalize everything. So the, the pressure at the tip of the wire and the pressure at the tip of the catheter are the same. You pass the wire distally and you get a number of uh, 0 0.77. So is that an abnormal FFR? Wrong. We didn't give adenosine yet. So that's a resting gradient. <laughs> so, so then you take that resting gradient and you do a true FFR and you give adenosine. So you induce hyperemia and the FFR is 0 0.58. So I think we would agree that that is a, a significant lesion. And then you pull it back during the infusion, and in the proximal LAD, you really don't have a significant, uh, physiologically significant disease. So what um, we decided here is to just treat this one area um, with a single stent, and he, he has done well, and that was several years ago. So this is my last slide and the only uh, data slide but just to, um, you know, for the, to give you the, the overview of the FAME trial, because it's pretty, pretty remarkable um, data. When you, this was a randomized trial of about 1,000 people to angiographic-guided PCI versus FFR-guided PCI. And when you look at the composite of death MI, bypass surgery, or repeat PCI at one year, and those who underwent PCI in the angiographic arm, their event rate was 18.3% versus the FFR-guided PCR, which had an event rate of 13.2%. So um, I think fairly compelling, and probably in a lot of your centers, you'll be seeing some of FAME 3 moving forward, which I think that case I just showed you would be someone who would be potentially someone we, we treat in FAME 3. So with that, I'll thank you.